Um, and then we will move on to our last presentation of HamSci 2020. Uh, last but not least is David Vine, WA1EAW, from the Amateur Radio Club of Augusta on the language of amateur radio. Hey there, Laura. Hello. Can you hear me all right? Okay, great. Well, uh, I David, I'm going to go on. Have a video. David, can I can go play. right to the video. Yeah. Uh, do you want to introduce the video, or do you want to go straight to it? I'll uh, I'll, I'll speak for a minute. Okay, sure. Uh, I've been uh, sort of on a um, a path which uh, started with you know, my looking at plain language and how amateur radio operators speak a kind of a foreign language that, you know, a lot of people just don't understand, but it has evolved into more of a, a concern about uh, amateur radio visibility in the classroom and the use of all of the different amateur radio uh, techniques that are uh, available to teach just about every aspect of science in the K-12 classrooms, primarily middle schools and high schools. And I think that is necessary not only for uh, our own students in those fields, uh, in those schools to, you know, be exposed to the, the, the fields of electronics and communications and uh, geophysical science like we're talking about today. Uh, so it's very important and I believe, and, and if you stop and think about it, maybe you'll agree with me, that amateur radio really is the only single activity that can encompass just about any STEM topic. You know, all of the different aspects of the science and technology and engineering and math in amateur radio uh, can be able to help uh, middle and high school students uh, not only progress in, in their chosen fields, but also perhaps to expose them to amateur radio so that they'll become licensed and uh, increase our ranks as we age out. But go ahead with the uh, video, Laura. That pretty much summarizes everything. Good afternoon. My name is David A. Vine. I reside in Aiken, South Carolina, and I hold a master's degree in business administration from Rowan University. I am a general class amateur radio operator, first licensed during the 1960s. My poster topic is about the need for a paradigm shift in the thinking of radio amateurs. We need to expand our thinking and our vocabulary to encompass more discourse in science, technology, engineering, and math, also known as STEM, topics. We need to influence educators to elevate amateur radio to the level of a core teaching tool for STEM subjects in middle and high schools throughout the country. Much wider use of amateur radio tools, techniques, concepts, and methods integrated into STEM learning can combine fun, family, friends, and public service activities for more effective teaching of STEM topics. Amateur radio is often referred to as a hobby. I believe a more descriptive word is enterprise. Some claim this is a misnomer because it refers to a business entity. I take the broad view of the word enterprise, which includes such synonyms as initiative, undertaking, voluntary action, etc. Many radio amateurs take for granted the technical and scientific aspects of our enterprise. To survive, amateur radio needs young adults who enthusiastically embrace our form of radio communication. To appeal to this youthful demographic, we must communicate all of the science, technology, engineering, and math learning opportunities inherent in amateur radio. In fact, amateur radio is the only single activity that can foster learning in nearly all science, technology, engineering, and math subjects. We need to expand our vocabulary to encompass ideas that fit into today's teaching curriculum, particularly for middle and high school students. 
Database research shows that mainstream education in the United States very seldom utilizes amateur radio as a feature-rich tool set for STEM instruction. The American Radio Relay League's School Club Roundup Contest reveals an extremely small participation rate in the most populous states such as California, Texas, Florida, New York, and Pennsylvania. Literature searches in specialized databases confirm the lack of amateur radio activities in schools. One notable exception is the demonstration program conducted by the Amateur Radio on the International um, Space Station have Working a license, Group. Amateur radio operator and do you use your license for any other communications besides ARIS? Over. I've been a licensed radio operator now for uh, probably only about a year and a half in preparation for this space flight, um, and I've only had the chance to use it up here on the space station, and I've really enjoyed doing that, including just making random contacts across the United there States. There are excellent examples of a few local amateur radio groups making significant inroads into classrooms, helping students learn STEM topics using amateur radio. At a minimum, these efforts need to be documented and widely published. We need to influence decision makers within the K-12 education community to adopt amateur radio as a core teaching tool in STEM learning. You might be asking yourself, how does David's topic fit into a conference centered on the study of the aurora using amateur radio techniques? Simply put, this unique conference clearly illustrates the enormous capability of amateur radio in the realm of learning. Amateur radio is a scientific research tool as well as a teaching tool. Amateur radio encompasses an enormous range of disciplines. Radio amateurs routinely write about highly technical subjects. Some of this research, experimentation, and documentation fulfills our FCC mandate to continue and extend the amateur radio operator's proven ability to contribute to the advancement of the radio art and to advance skills in both the communication and technical phases of the art, among other purposes of the amateur radio service. Amateur radio's FCC mandate to expand and the existing reservoir of trained operators, technicians, and electronics experts is clearly fulfilled when we enter classrooms to facilitate learning. To grow and develop amateur radio as well as expand scientific research, we must integrate this valuable learning tool into more K-12 classrooms by raising our discourse to a level that cannot be ignored. Thank you for your time and attention. Well, that's uh, pretty much it, and I think it's summarized. And, you know, the whole point there is that uh, amateur radio needs to be uh, much more utilized in the classrooms. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to do that on a smaller basis here in, in the uh, South Carolina and Georgia region uh, that, that we serve through the uh, Amateur Radio Club of Augusta, but I am hoping that uh, as part of this kind of an activity, uh, influencing you folks, that you might think more about the K-12, to uh, basically middle school and high school aspects. And I'm sure there's a lot of different ways that you can do outreach uh, to involve the students in, in your work. Thank you so much, David. What questions do you all have for him? I think that was a great video, David. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. That was excellent. Uh, I posted some material to the Google Drive about non-STEM uses of amateur radio in education. Uh, Christina Collins is on. She has a first author publication on the topic. And at Case, we're running what I think is the only non-STEM amateur radio collegiate level curricular course catalog class. And uh, it, it's been an interesting experience, but congratulations on this. I think um, one thing, you know, for our group that this makes me think of is, you know, um, I've been thinking for a while that it would be good to have, or, or maybe I should rephrase this, often I get emails from teachers or people saying, you know, how do we do ham size sorts of activities in the, in the classroom? Mm. And at the moment, and I think that's an 
excellent question. And at the moment, we, we don't really have a person that has the time or has been dedicated to figuring out how to, you know, take the information we have or to take the projects that we're doing and, and really deliver it to a classroom effectively. So I think um, every once in a while, I meet someone who seems like they might be able to fulfill that role. And I try to bring them on a little bit, but I haven't, I haven't been super successful with that yet. So I think, um, I think right now we're kind of in this stage where we are really working on, you know, we're really working on engineering this personal space weather station and Case mm -hmm. Western is, um, you know, working on this low cost version, especially, um, but I think at some point we're, we're going to have to figure out how to package this up and, and make it so that more people, um, it, it can be used by people at a more introductory level. And um, we may have to really identify a person who both knows or can understand and learn the science and engineering, as well as knows how to package it for the schools and has the time and interest to do that. So um, I, I think that's something that we are looking for and in need of, but we're not quite there yet. I'm very interested to hear what Christina has to say, uh, especially about non-ham uses, I mean non-STEM uses of ham radio, but in any case, I'm very interested in what you have to say, Christina. Yeah, uh, briefly, um, David linked to the paper on IEEE Explore, but that version of it is behind a paywall, so I'll make a note and, uh, and send you a copy later. Um, when we were starting to use the Ham Radio Club at Case as a teaching tool, uh, it was because we needed a way to defend its existence. It had a very small uh, group of members, and this is a thing that a lot of college ham clubs have run into, is that they need to be able to justify roof access for their schools. They need to be able to justify the resources that they're using. And the ARRL, especially in the STEM fields, has done a tremendous amount to try to get high school students licensed uh, for many years. And there was a little bit of a gap that you hit when you got to college students. So the solution that we arrived at was we needed to make it a thing of value for the department and the school. And uh, we weren't ready yet to use it in technical courses, but we do have this general education program at CASE where uh, you can have general education sort of Comp 101 classes that are based on a topic, and we taught a course about amateur radio. And the philosophy that we sort of adopted for it, um, and for this uh, I credit David, was this idea of ham radio sloyd, uh, and SLOID is this term for sort of technical classes where you start out learning how to use a chisel or a knife and it's project-based learning. And it's a uh, Finnish method of education. Uh, SLOID comes from uh, the word slug, which means handy. Mm -hmm. And um, so sort of this idea was that you can have amateur radio be this um, sort of the, the central thing, right? this Aleph from which all of your education stems in the same way I, that Sloyd is working. I call it a, I call it a core teaching tool. Mm -hmm, exactly. It's the same idea. And, uh, but what we found was that emphasizing it, not just as a STEM tool, because, you know, the thing about STEM is it's like, okay, you've got science and technology and engineering and math, and then you add history and gym and you've got school. Um, and, you know, it, you can use it for, uh, humanities as well, I think very effectively. Oh, yeah. um, mm -hmm. And in that way, we brought a lot of students into the fold. I think there's students who majored in electrical engineering who wouldn't have majored in electrical engineering if they hadn't taken this class. I absolutely believe that. Um, yeah. It really was something where it's accessible enough and people were able to connect it to various things um, where they can, uh, you know, you can connect it up to almost anything that you want. And that makes it wonderfully versatile. It has a barrier to entry because you do, you have to do things. You have to have some equipment, you have to have access to some expertise, but that barrier to entry is so wonderfully low and it's such a community and it's wonderful to be able to invite people into it. So I absolutely commend everything you're doing, trying to get it into, uh, into more schools.
Thank, thank you, you so much. And thank you, David. I think it is uh, just about six o'clock in time for uh, to turn it back over to Nathaniel to, to bring it on home. Thank you so much, Laura. Let me try still. Yes. Thank you so much, Laura, and for all of the presenters and attendees. I have very much enjoyed this workshop. Um, you know, it's been an electronic workshop. This was a last minute transition over to this format. Uh, I know I and probably many other people were disappointed we weren't able to travel in person this year. But I have to say, um, in the midst of everything that's going on in the world, these last two days have really been a bright spot in my day. And mm -hmm. I just want to commend everyone for doing such a good job to make this work. So thank you. Um, I'd especially, um, I think right now, um, in closing, I'd like to just have kind of a 10 to 15 minute open round table uh, before I say the real final closing comments. So why don't I just open up to the floor and we take, you know, maybe 10, 20 minutes uh, to take general comments and discussion. Are there any comments? Yeah, Nathaniel, this was amazing. I'm really duly impressed that you pulled this whole thing off. Congratulations from all of us. Thank, thank you, David. Thank you so much. Yes, it's excellent. It's going to be the standard to follow for some time to come. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm really hoping, though, I have to say what I'm very much hoping is that we can meet in person next year, but I would like to have a blended format workshop. And in that format, we would have the talks be given orally, just like um, you would normally at an in-person Hampside workshop, but also use Zoom to make it available to outside people and also to people within the workshop and maybe come up with other interesting ways of using some of these virtual tools. So maybe we could get the best of both worlds. Still have our, um, still have all of our off, um, like non-formal presentation meetings, still have the advantages of being together, but also get the advantage of, you know, really this international participation. Well, also consider Daniel. having remote people make presentations that are not present. Yes, we would absolutely do that. Absolutely. Nathaniel? Yes. I'd like to mention that uh, you did a wonderful job of organizing this very quickly because mm -hmm. when you think about it, you know, this was what you had maybe three weeks, four weeks that where you made all those decisions and, and really got together. Well, I think uh, two, and, weeks. Uh, let, two weeks. Let me, let me point out one thing. Let me point out one thing. Two weeks, okay. Ham radio operators have that special capability to organize communications ad hoc very quickly. And I just wanted to point that out. So thank you for doing all that. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, yes, good save, Nathan. And uh, I think it uh, also shows that for the next one, you could get uh, international um, participation by putting it online. Yeah, if there's any disadvantage, it's that we didn't have enough time to publicize the whole thing, get more participation. I yeah. agree. And even with that, we've had at the peak, I've been watching the numbers, and at the peak of this meeting, we've had about 250 people participate. Yeah, yeah and that's a great way to bring in more participants. And, and a blended meeting next year will be good. Uh, after this is over, Nathaniel and everyone else who put this on, I'm going to toast you with a bottle of Corona beer. <laughs> I, have, um, I was going to make that the official uh, beverage of the meeting this year. Right, there you go. <laughs> Don't forget Corona cigars. Yes. Right. <laughs> um, by the way, I, I also wanted to encourage us to, when we're doing the blended workshop next time, right? Yeah. Um, we had little examples in the posters of people actually doing demonstrations. I mean, even one of the talks had someone that said, okay, here, I'm going to wheel the crammer around and I'm going to show you what's going on. Um, we should look at that more and expand that a little bit so that, that the demo room doesn't have to be just in-person stuff. Yeah. You, can have, you can have some remote people demonstrating things. You know, you can show people a lot of things with a web SDR and that sort of thing. And so it, it should be possible to do that and add a little bit more. There's a couple of questions. Uh, there's a couple of comments, by the way, that are ro scrolling by here. And in the comments that's saying that other people have done this, like Malcolm Lund says, you know, this is similar to what I have done with, um, you know, Incos, which was system engineering, WebEx, GoToMeeting, Slack. Um, she's done that more than three times successfully. So there are other 
classic examples of how we can even add to this. And um, we should definitely take a look at that. I agree. And I'm thinking we're uh, going to uh, shamelessly uh, borrow from you for the DCC this <laughs> fall, especially not so much the posters. I mean, the posters are a great idea, but uh, if, like uh, Phil says, just bring the guy in with the camera to the demo room and go around each table and say, what does this do? Why did you bring it? How did you build it? Give them 10 minutes apiece, and it'll be very interesting. Yeah. I actually think that might be a better format. Um, for I think I think that five minute video five ten minute video is a really good format for the demos perhaps even better than the e posters um, I think we'll have to talk about that some more but I do like these I thought the video demos were very nice yeah I actually was confused on that I was um, initially doing uh, just a video and then later you asked me for a poster so I had to whip a poster together real quick so. Um, yeah, the one problem I had with the posters is they seemed to go by a little too fast for me to grasp what was really happening. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, they got flashed and moved here and moved to that corner and moved to the next corner, as opposed to like a slide where you would get a quarter of the poster and then the presenter would talk about it. I, I just saw the poster, the picture go by and it was like, wait, I want to see that and I didn't get enough time. I did find it useful to download it and watch it uh, yeah. in real time. I think some of that is also because I would say we only had one week to turn this around, really. And so, you know, had we had more time, it maybe could have gone to short talks. But um, yeah. And yeah, I, I really I want to really give credit to Laura Brandt on this and, and to Liz, both Liz and Laura Brandt, because when I first decided to, uh, to change this over to an uh, electronic or I first realized, not just decided, I realized I needed to change this over to an electronic format. Um, I was like, oh man, I don't know how I'm gonna deal with these poster sessions. I was just like really down at that point. And, and you know, Liz and Laura, um, they stepped up and Laura's like, I have a great idea on how to do this. She wrote up a whole document, she put it online. She's like, here's what I propose. I read the thing, I was like, great, <laughs> let's do it. So thank you, Laura. Uh, thank you so much, Liz. Thank you for your support and for letting us uh, borrow Laura for this. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> I'm really excited also, you know, the format gives me a lot of ideas for having an Aurora citizen science meeting as well that we've never done. And I really feel like this worked um, very well. So that's super exciting. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Nathaniel. You're welcome, Dev. Thank you. And yeah. uh, as so this is Dev Joshi, and uh, as I mentioned yesterday, we're hoping um, uh, we're all set to have him join us at the University of Scranton in two months once we get through all this uh, paperwork and everything else. He'll be working on the um, personal space other station project full time. All right, welcome to the project. Looking forward to working with you, Dev. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Looking forward to joining the community. And John, as someone said, it's really nice to have somebody in a lab with scopes going behind you, and I don't know what else there. So that was that's great. I think that's great. <laughs> I like how that, um, and that's just your house, right? Yeah, this is one of my three workshops in the basement. Yeah, have you got you've got some kind of a modulation pattern going on behind you there too. There's a story behind that, and what it is is I had to teach an FPGA class, and the Tangerine people will be happy because it's the Max 10 FPGA doing that. And it's yes. an example of an I2S oh. bus running a signal out to a scope in XY mode, and I have it rotating a CWRU logo with <laughs> one hertz sine wave in the XY <laughs> axis, and that's how it's converting nice. itself. So that's beautiful. It's one, of my, one of my labs that I did for the FPGA class I taught. So oh, That's geez. really cool. Anyway, it, it, when all of us are sitting at home in our home offices or what have you, it's nice to see someone who has a lab in their home office, so to speak, and uh, reminds me of a place that I'm staying away from right now. Doesn't everyone have a lab in their home? Oh, sure. Yeah, I, I don't get that. What are you talking about? No lab? <laughs> <laughs> ah, jeez. And then oh, Bill, a, we're going to have to talk. John yeah, I think three, so. He has three labs in his house. Well, if you count the wood shop, it's four. Okay. <laughs> I just, well, my my I lab just is in my, my lab and uh, office and shack are all the one 
all the same. Yeah. Just, I just had an alert on uh, Live Aurora Network that camera number three has Live Aurora going on in Iceland. As we speak. As we speak, yeah. Liz, Liz's eyebrows just went up, so I think. <laughs> <laughs> going to go you, right to that feed. Yes, go right Can you man, post the content is the there. URL? We'll crash the server. Can, can you, you post, post the URL so we can see it? Hey, Liz, you uh, want to screen share it? Well, you know it? Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Can you screen share it? That would be great. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, Let's see. See it for Michael. Well, I'll. Uh, See if I can get During that. the conference, I uh, I'm watching it on my phone, so I have to bring it up on. on uh, what? What was that, Bill? During the conference, I probably worked over 100 stations in on FT8. Oh, jeez! My <laughs> office, shack, and lab are all one thing. It's all one place. The I'm stop shopping. Contesting. Oh, the cat is here. <laughs> uh oh. The place has gone to the cats. <laughs> Yeah. No, that's what I call an eyeball QSO. That, that cat I see really that, likes you. Uh, Electra yeah. is waving, and Bella is here someplace. Yeah, we, we show off Bella here. Here we go with Bella. Oh, oh look at oh, that man. kitty. Oh man. Okay, kitty cat. Take a look. There's a little. Oh. Take a look at Bella. Yeah. We're off to the races now. Okay. Oh, Pet allergies are kicking in. Science <laughs> is brought to its knees by cats. It's the only real purpose of the internet. Isn't there this YouTube we go. now? Yeah. The yeah. most successful evolution. This is what our fields lecture over Zoom oh. developed into. Oh, That's no. correct. You gotta come back. Come on. There you go. Oh. Those, Those cats oh, sure have us well trained. Okay. That was paying a little bit of attention. Okay, now we mute. I, did, I just uh, thought I'd mention, I told Christina about it, but everybody should Google the Infinite Cat Project and go check it out. Uh, it's really pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Mm. Or check out Simon the Cat. That's a good animation that's yeah, always Simon fun. Simon's good. <laughs> Beautiful. Does anyone have comments that, that hasn't spoken, that wants to say hello? Yeah, I would like to, to say thank you again uh, for all the organizers and Nathaniel in particular for inviting people from other countries, from scientific community, and uh, we would like to, to meet people and collaborate with our neighbors. Uh, we are from Canada, by the way. Thank you. Canada from uh, James French as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you so, so much. We're glad to have you, Anton. Thank you. Hello. Go ahead. Oh, now we got the dog video. Ah, no, we have Aurora. Yeah, this is a thing. We have Aurora, even Aurora. better than cats. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Uh, there you oh go. Oh, my gosh. There she is. Yeah, we got it. That's this is, real, this is real time now, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Oh, well, within is probably cool. 20 seconds. Yeah. And what's the location? It's on uh, uh, south shore of uh, Iceland. It's called Falkarider, something like that. Wow. And uh, there's clouds uh, there. Sure. Well. Mm -hmm. The app is really cool because it will alert you when the aurora is just barely visible and then when it's like really visible and it's moving cool. it's quickly. going crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it's got very nice uh, qualitative levels for, for what, you're, what you want. That's and that was wonderful. kind of what I was asking one of the presenters earlier. How how good of a camera do you have to, have also, to be able to identify those levels? I mean, we could get. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> now, someone said uh, earlier that really the only camera for uh, live video would be the, the Sony A7S II. Okay. So cheap cameras are not going to do it is what the answer is. No, right? I mean, you can use a cheap, like a $350 uh, Canon DSLR and take a 30 second exposure and uh, you'll get a good snapshot, decent snapshot. And so like this camera is seeing more photons than our eyes can see. And so like at its lowest alert level is probably not going to do that much for your eyes if you really were there in Iceland. but. Um, but some people want an alert at that level, and then it goes up from there. So, 
Okay. Yeah, it looks uh -huh. like we're uh, going to lose it now. So. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I just wanted to join in the conversation. Uh, I'm Walt Copan from NIST and uh, home of WWV, WWVH. Uh, thanks so much for the invitation to join your party. And I've been really enjoying the conversations and the uh, various the technical discussions. Uh, great work, everyone. Oh, yeah. For thank, you, thank you so much for coming, Walt. I really appreciate it. Uh, this thanks is, for uh, joining us. This is uh, Jim, WA3FET. I just wanted to pass along from Angel and other uh, friends in Puerto Rico, uh, their thanks to Hamsai over the years for helping with uh, Hurricane Maria and also the earthquakes. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Copen was very, very gracious in hosting a bunch of us for the WWE 100th anniversary celebration last fall. Uh, David Kasdan and Christina and a bunch of other people were there. We had a really great time, and I'm I'm just so pleased that you showed you showed up again and and checked in with us. That's great. I, I it's too a really pleasure. Thank you for all of your support, and it's a great uh, community to uh, uh, to be part of. And uh, uh, so, thanks for making the trek out to the hundredth anniversary. And uh, next year actually is going to be the one hundred twentieth anniversary of the. National Institute of Standards and Technology, formerly known as the National Bureau of Standards in the U.S. Well, yes. I, I too want to extend greetings and thanks for being here. And um, when are you getting your amateur radio license? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to work on that next time I visit Cleveland, David. Okay, just just thought I'd check. It's it's just you know you bring it up at these occasions. Okay, good. Yes. So just out of curiosity, how many people are hams on here? The, one of the first signals they ever heard was uh, WWV. All of us. And it was all of us, right? That and Loran A, those were the two killers for me. Yeah, WWV is a STEM education package all in itself. It yep. When, I, I don't know if you heard um, that um, Phil Carr in K9Q actually wrote a WWV simulator to run on the Mac. And you're going to love this. So he, he gives it to a friend of his who's, who's a blind amateur. And the blind amateur is listening to this. Now, I'm, I remember, he's blind, so he's just listening. He comes in and he says, well, you know, at uh, 30 seconds after, uh, you've got one tick in there that's the wrong frequency. And by golly, <laughs> he, he debugged it by ear and found a mistake that Phil had made in the simulator. Out of control. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah I've amazing. heard that simulator. It's pretty good. Yeah, yeah it is. It's awesome. Um, yeah. Nathaniel, I know that James French was trying to talk, but I guess his microphone isn't having yeah. problems. It did he type? Did ahead. he type in a question or anything like that? Well, one thing you wanted me to mention. I'll just let, I'll let him talk. Uh, you can you can unmute yourself, James. I think he says his audio mic wasn't working, but we could oh. he could try it, try it again. Okay. Well, I know one thing that he was saying is he wanted me to remind everyone that we have these, a few ways that people can get involved with HamSci, which we have mentioned before already. But if you go to, I'll share my screen again. Here we go. Um, if you go to the HamSci page, we now have this Get Involved tab on top here. And there's multiple ways you can get involved. One is the HamSci Google group. So if you want to stay apprised of all of the HamSci information, um, or if you want to, uh, if you have questions, you want to make comments, this is a two-way uh, listserv community, you can just uh, join our Google group um, right there. We also have bi-weekly telecoms, uh, telecoms using Zoom. So using the same technology, these are smaller meetings. They run roughly an hour every other Thursday. And you just look at the calendar down here, and if it says HamSci Research Telecom, you can just click on that, and it gives you the information for how to join the Zoom meeting. And um, these are somewhat informal. Sometimes they're more just discussions. We've been doing a lot with uh, looking at the Doppler shift uh, measurements from Steve Serwin uh, recently, and, um, and more of the TIDs uh, using the RBN and WhisperNet. We've been talking a lot about propagation with Carl Etzel swab recently, so we've been uh, doing having the science discussions on Thursday afternoons at 3 p.m. Eastern. 
Um, I should also point out that there is, uh, on Monday nights, the Tangerine SDR group from Tapper, they have an audio-only conference that's run through something called their TeamSpeak server. So the information is there as well. So you, Monday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, this is more of an engineering discussion. And the Thursday by weekly telecons is more of a science discussion. So those are ways you can get involved. And if you're not a ham radio operator yet, there's a little bit of information about that down here. And you can go to the American Radio Relay League uh, website for more information on how to become a ham radio operator. Did that cover uh, what I needed to cover there, James? Yep. You got a yes. I yes. got a yes. Great. And you covered the Tangerine SDR. We are Monday. We're looking for volunteers to help. We always can use somebody that can uh, uh, help produce parts and uh, code. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's all sorts of different engineering projects, coding projects that need to be done. All sorts of things. And if anyone is interested in education, the Citizen Science Association has started meetings to try and figure out how to get educational citizen science to people whose kids have to stay home now. Um, so if you're interested in joining those meetings, uh, feel free to drop me an email at aurorasaurus.info at gmail.com. Well, it seems like things are quieting down a bit now. <laughs> um, so I think it's about time to bring this workshop to a close and let people enjoy their time with their families and get some dinner now. Um, but wow, this has just been an outstanding experience. And I think it's going to, um, I, I think this is very, very good. So uh, is there anything else I should say? I hope to see you on the telecons, um, on the listservs. Uh, we will keep in touch. And, and again, just thank you very much um, thank you again to my organizing committee, uh, which includes um, the Science and Program Committee, Phil Erickson, Catherine Mitchell, Liz McDonald, Laura Brandt, Bill Lyles, and then also to the people at Scranton, uh, the University of Scranton, um, who are on the local organizing committee. I'd like to especially recognize uh, Lori McCoy, our secretary, who made all these hotel reservations and unfortunately mm -hmm. had to cancel them, Franny Mancuso, our director of uh, conferences and event services and uh, MD Maktoumi and Declan Mahal and the other professors at, at the University of Scranton. So I'd like to thank them as well and for all of your support. And I am hopeful that we can just have a meeting in person in Scranton next year and pretty much use this year's, um, you know, the plans we had for this year as a template for next year. And uh, maybe we'll talk about having that theme working with uh, Tamitha on uh, space more operational space weather applications next year. Nathaniel, you want to yes. mention the, the DCC real quick? Yes, sure. Well, actually, why don't you mention the DCC? So oh. I am, I'm certainly, so people should understand there is a very specific reason the HAMSA workshop is in March, okay? The reason it's in March is because it is about six months approximately away from another conference or workshop called the Tapper Digital Communications Conference. Um, and the idea is that this gives us six month checkpoints between doing ham size stuff and doing Tapper stuff. So it's, this is our sister conference as you were. So Scotty, why don't you talk about that? Okay, so the, the DCC a Digital Communications Conference is kind of like the ham size conference, only it's more for uh, radio engineering and digital uh, modes than it is for about science. So we kind of, you notice that the HAMSI conference started out with a little bit of engineering and then mostly science the rest of the weekend. Well, the DCC will be mostly about engineering and about uh, digital radio topics. It's um, Friday and Saturday and a half day Sunday. So it's a little bit longer. Uh, this year, it moves around the country. So this year it's gonna be in Charlotte and the dates are September 15th and 16th. I better get the dates right. Um, I'll look at it while, while I'm uh, talking here. But it's uh, the second week in September. And uh, this year we have a special treat for the software people. We actually have arranged it to be back to back with the GNU radio conference, which immediately follows us. 
and I think they're the 16th to 20th, so that would make us like the 14th, 15th, 13th, 14th, and 15th. Here, it's on the screen, Scotty. It is. It is on the screen? I'm sharing it. Oh, okay. I don't see that. That's kind of weird. Okay. It's because I got your screen minimized. Okay, there you go. September 11th to 13th. I'd hate for you to show up the wrong days, although Charlotte is a nice place to visit. We're hoping that uh, this uh, virus thing will be major the majority of it will be over by then, so we won't have to do what uh, all the work that Nathaniel and company had to do. But I think uh, after seeing the success of this, I'd really like to incorporate some of the things that he did into DCC and hopefully not make it a, a uh, all online, but we'll see how the, how the climate goes. Um, what else, anything I missed? Anyway, it's a, it's a, it's pretty good collection of, uh, of, uh, digital, uh, radio modes like DMR, uh, APRS, um, uh, D star on the radio side, a lot of SDR thing, a lot of SDR stuff, FPGA things. Uh, last, uh, last session last year, we had, uh, the Sunday seminar is a four hour deep dive on Sunday from 8 a.m. to noon, and we had the Satnogs guys come in and describe their entire system. I mean, down to the level where you, when you left, you really understood how everything worked. So it's kind of a, was a, is a brain dump on Sunday. So, and then on, uh, we also have something that maybe Nathaniel was, was you were referring to is uh, we have what we called uh, uh, lightning talks and they're five minutes long. There's a, uh, one or two slides, and uh, that's uh, about all there is. <laughs> so, and, and they go very fast, and uh, they require not much uh, preparation in advance. And it's really helpful because some people just really can't take the extra time to, to do a 45-minute presentation. And that's it. Our, our slots are uh, longer than the 20-minute ham size slots. They're 45 minutes. So you get a little bit more in-depth view, uh, and we encourage uh, technical presentations. So... It's uh, a little bit different than like uh, a hamvention or uh, a hamcation type presentation. So that's about it. I look forward to seeing people there. It's uh, it's fun time, a great networking time. And uh, also we have on Friday evening, we have what they call a social, which is just a three hour get together and we provide enough food so you really don't have to go out anywhere to eat and you can just uh, socialize with uh, all the people that you've listened to all day talk. So it's, it's kind of fun. It's a great time. I love that workshop. So I hope to be able to see all of you there in person this September. Well, we hope, that, we, we hope we can be half as good as this one. I, I'm sure it will be fantastic. <laughs> well, with that, I think I would like to say 73 to everybody. Um, it has been a wonderful experience. And I wish all of you the best. So, 7 3, and we will see you soon. Thank you again for your effort. 7 3. Great job. Thank you. 73. 73. Big pow up here. 73. <laughs> Thanks again. Thanks again, Laura, for your outstanding help. That was fantastic. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>